Well, thank you. Thanks to Dirk and to Julius for inviting me. This is my first time in Columbia, so it's been great to um, meet you and to hear about what you're doing. And what I'm going to do today is not talk about traumatic brain injury, um, but I want to tell you about the surprising role that the hippocampus plays in language use and processing. And I'll start by acknowledging the graduate students and postdocs who've um, contributed to a lot of the work that I'll be talking about today, um, as well as Sarah Brown Schmidt, who's been one of the primary collaborators in this line of work, and our funding sources. So when I talk about this topic, I like to not start with the hippocampus or memory and start on getting us on the same page with things I think we can agree on in terms of what we know about language. So there are these fundamental properties of human languages. So we say that language is a system of arbitrary relations. And so we mean that without, with a few exceptions, um, the relationship between the phonological form and its meaning is arbitrary. Language processing is incremental. So the meaning of many of the words that I'm saying right now will not become clear until the end of my sentence. And so many sources of information have to be generated, integrated, and maintained to create meaning. Language use is flexible and creative. We see this in the way that speakers rhetorically or even uh, poetically um, select particular details to represent for a, spe a specific listener on a particular occasion. And language use is multimodal. So encompassing far more than a spoken stream of words to include the way that our gestures and objects and gaze become integral into language processing itself. So while most folks agree that these are fundamental proper, proper, uh, properties of language and that these things are accomplished automatically and with seemingly little effort, how they're accomplished in the brain is a source of more controversy. So there's been a lot of attempts in the literature to link particular forms of memory with particular aspects of language processing. And while these different proposals are not mutually exclusive, indeed we've come to understand language processing as relying on a network of cognitive or neural structures, um, with the exception of a role for new semantic learning, um, the hippocampal dependent declarative memory system has received little attention as a candidate mechanism in language use and processing. And historically that has made really great sense. So um, the traditional view of the medial temporal lobe is that it contributes exclusively to long-term memory. Hippocampal amnesia has been defined as a selective deficit in memory, leaving other cognitive domains, including language, intact. And um, our understanding about the role of the hippocampus in even acquiring new vocabulary items has been that it is time sensitive. So it plays an initial role in acquisition, but that its role is short. Um, and through neocortical consolidation processes, the hippocampus um, doesn't uh, contribute to the long-term maintenance of our semantic memory system. Over the past maybe two decades, however, there have been a number of pretty significant um, advances in our understanding of the functionality of the hippocampus and the time course over which hippocampal representations become available. And so just to give you an example um, of some of these advances, I can use my time here in Columbia. So as I have moved through the city, my hippocampus automatically and obligatorily forms a number of spatial and temporal relations. Hippocampal dependent um, representations are highly associative. So I'm going to be talking about some studies that I did as a doctoral student at the University of Illinois. And in doing so, I can become flooded with those distant memories um, of my time there. I can also recover other remote distant memories. So I can think about other times that I've been here to South Carolina. Some of the critical advances though in our understanding of the functionality of the hippocampus is that it also contributes to thinking about the future, imagination and creativity. So I could imagine and think about what a subsequent trip here um, to this building and to visit you would be like. But perhaps most significantly for theories of language use and processing, the hippocampus is active now. So my hippocampus is knitting together a representation of this moment, and it's making that representation available to me now in service of my ongoing behavior. So these advances have a number of implications for the memory literature, um, but they have pretty significant um, implications for theories of language use and processing. So I have proposed that many aspects of language use and processing place high demands on and receive significant contribution from 
the hippocampal declarative memory system. And a particularly compelling way to test this idea is to study patients who have bilateral hippocampal damage and profound declarative memory impairment. And so what we do in my lab is we use a number of methods, including discourse analysis, um, eye tracking, some neuroimaging. And in doing so, we have revealed a number of linguistic and decursive um, impairments in patients who don't have aphasia, but who only have this memory impairment. So um, what I want to do is to kind of set up one of the tasks that we routinely use, because that will help you um, understand uh, some of our methods. Um, so we often use this collaborative referencing task, and I'm going to show you a little bit about that in just a moment. Um, but what we uh, have reported is a surprising intact rate of learning for the acquisition of semantic labels when individuals with amnesia can um, draw on their previously acquired knowledge to make new associations for these abstract cards, such as calling this particular figure siesta man. And although they show remarkable learning in the task, it's a very communicatively demanding task. And so what I want to do next is give you a feel for the task, but I also want you to see um, one of these participants and you can evaluate um, what you think about their language ability. So um, a couple of observations. Um, they're really good at this task. They show remarkable learning in the context of this task. And this is something I'd be happy to talk about after the talk or during the question. Um, but what you can see is what's ideal about the task is there's all of this back and forth. So um, one session gives us nearly, um, you know, a couple dozen hours of language that we can analyze. But critically, I'm not talking about aphasia. So you can see that um, whatever disruptions I'm going to talk about in this presentation, this is a very different um, disruption in language than um, what is produced by stroke and that we would, what we would call aphasia. So what I want to do now is give you some examples of how having hippocampal amnesia or hippocampal damage um, disrupts some of these fundamental properties of language. And the first um, set of examples I want to give you are examples of how hippocampal amnesia disrupts the flexible and creative use of language. I'm going to tell you about two studies, um, but I want to um, tell you a little bit more about these patients. So in all the analyses I'm going to tell you about today, um, the sample size will be about four to six participants. Um, it's a very rare um, event to get um, an anoxic episode or herpes simplex encephalitis that produces um, the pattern of hippocampal damage that we need. But also, those are two conditions that can also produce other um, cognitive or neuropsychological impairments. So by definition, we only include those individuals who have bilateral hippocampal damage and who on neuropsychological testing only have a profound impairment in memory. So everyone, all the day I'm going to tell you about, these are all individuals who are clean or have normal intact performance on neuropsychological measures of language, intellect, executive functioning, attention, sort of you name it. Um, we study two males and four females. Um, they all are college educated. Um, they have a profound memory impairment. So the videos that I just showed you, that individual from trial to trial doesn't remember that he's just played this game. I've worked with him for almost 15 years. He couldn't recognize me or know my name. Um, in these studies, we have them bring in their own familiar communication partner. And then we also study healthy individuals in the same setup. And in this particular task, um, we have them do it 24 times across the two days, as I said. So in the first analysis of these data, we wanted to look at definite reference. And so when we tailor an utterance, um, we can use a definite reference like the in the windmill or an indefinite reference like a windmill. And in selecting an utterance that contains a definite reference, the speaker is signaling to the listener that the speaker believes that that referent can be identified in local context or through their um, shared communicative history. So it's signaling shared known information. And so what we were interested in is asking, wow, these patients show remarkable learning in this context. Do they use language that would mark that knowledge as shared explicitly through these definite references? And the answer is no, they don't. 
Um, so they're not using the definite article to signal that that information is shared. And just to give you a sense of what this looks like, um, this is data from the 24th trial of a participant with amnesia and a demographically matched healthy comparison participant. And you can see the comparison participant is overwhelmingly and explicitly marking all of those labels with a definite article. The participant with amnesia on 25% of the labels is still explicitly using an indefinite article, as though they are arriving at this label for the very first time, even though they now have labels that are very short and concise, um, period. So um, here I'm showing you the use of definite article use, um, bend into four sessions, and each session has six trials. And you can see that healthy comparison participants quickly reach um, ceiling level performance, and that the patients show this steady incline towards using more definite reference. But if we look um, more closely at these data, we see that their use is highly variable and inconsistent. So again, this is on the 24th or the third and fourth um, sessions. Um, you can see that um, there's still a lot of indefinite reference use. And the use of a definite article on one trial does not predict statistically its use on a subsequent trial. So this is increased use of it, but it's still um, almost random. So an analysis like this, we can show that the patients with amnesia who had described these cards multiple times and showed really remarkable learning for the labels are still using indefinite articles, again, as though they were encountering them for the very first time. This is one of the first studies that point to the hippocampal declarative memory system as playing a role in the flexible tailoring of utterances for specific partners on specific occasions. Um, and it was also um, somewhat unique in the literature because it's the first example or among the first examples of how this memory system contributes to language use beyond um, acquisition of new vocabulary items. So I next want to tell you a little bit about um, a study we did on the creative use of language. So this is, um, there's lots of ways that you can define creativity. This is one from the neuroscience literature that I um, particularly like, and it describes creativity as the rapid combination and recombination of existing mental representations to create novel ideas or ways of thinking. Um, if you look at the sociolinguistic literature, linguistic creativity as talked about as verbal play. So I would bet that many of you have already engaged in linguistic creativity today. So you have told funny stories or jokes, you've played with sounds or the meanings of words to come up with puns, um, teasing, self-deprecating humor, um, playing with the sounds of words. So what we did is we took this definition from the sociolinguistic literature and we created a coding system and we went back to that collaborative referencing task and looked for instances of playful, creativity with language while they were doing the task. And so if we look at just the productions of those participants with amnesia and the comparison participants and not their partners, we see that um, individuals who have hippocampal damage um, produce language that is coded or classified as creative or um, verbal play significantly less than um, healthy participants. And this is in the context of talking more than healthy people. So we had more language to look at, and in terms of that language, they are producing less instances of this verbal play. And I should also say that um, this is interesting because the semantic um, classification, the, the semantic content of the labels um, between groups was very similar. And that's particularly true at the beginning of these um, tasks and at the very end. But it was in the middle of these 24 trials where the comparison participants were very playful and creative. And so these are just some examples of labels that healthy participants said to describe these abstract figures. So Kramer holding a box of Seinfeld cereal. The bird, which in the beginning of the trials they were calling the bird, that morphed over time to the label being Tippi Hedren. Tippi Hedren is the actress who played in the Hitchcock film The Bird, The Birds. Um, healthy comparison participants use labels like Swirly Viking ship, Indian Stock Exchange, the horsey, of course, of coursey. Hey, professor, I have the answer. Help, I can't get up to describe these tamgrams. And then other labels, which I reserve 
to assume there might be something um, going on with our healthy comparison participants. Um, but nonetheless, you see this playfulness, you see this creativity, you see the weaving of all kinds of information in service of creating these labels um, in very playful, creative ways that you just don't see in the participants with amnesia. And I should say, it's not that these amnesic participants don't have the semantic content, right? So they know about these films or these TV shows. They don't draw on it and weave it into their social interactions in these playful, creative ways. So here we see a role of the hippocampal declarative memory system in its role for creating, updating, juxtaposing, mental representations, and in their flexible and novel use, and how that contributes to creative aspects of language. Um, and this fits with other work from um, our lab and other folks looking at the relationship between hippocampus and um, linguistic creativity, but also creative thinking more broadly and imagination. I wanna say here something about specificity. So in all the studies that we do, um, we study these patients who have the bilateral hippocampal damage and the memory impairment, but we also, within that study or in a replication study, will um, do the same study in a group of patients who have um, lesions outside of the medial temporal lobe. So we want to be in a position to make strong claims that what we're finding are specific to the hippocampus and not a general byproduct of brain injury more broadly. So um, in the two analyses that I've showed you so far, um, we've studied a group of patients who have large bilateral um, lesions to the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, um, who have no memory impairment, who have no MTL damage, and who have no disruptions in these language functions. Um, the specificity of analyses like these um, have also been taken to bolster claims about what role the hippocampus may play in language evolution. So, in these analyses, we see how the hippocampus contributes to language in its flexibility, its um, recombination, um, perhaps its generativity, and its creativity. And those are exactly the components that exist as a fundamental property of language. And here's someone arguing that the hippocampus, the neural structure that supports those cognitive abilities, um, may have been an early um, critical structure in language evolution. Um, next, I'm going to tell you a little bit about incremental language processing. So here we're looking at online referential processing. So we know that to understand and use reference, we have to maintain a representation of the unfolding discourse, and we have to integrate information about refer um, referential form with rich representations of context. So what we were interested in here is there were other um, studies in the literature pointing to um, a role of the hippocampus in maintaining representations over very short delays and even no delays at all. And if that extends into language, this is one of those places where these changes in how we think about the time course of hippocampal contributions to cognition more broadly would have a big impact in how we think about language processing. So in this study, um, we had participants um, look at a video screen and we're going to track where they look. It's an eye tracking study. We're going to track where they look um, when they hear the sentence. So in this study, um, we have two conditions. This is the different gender condition. So participants are going to hear, they're going to be introduced to a character Minnie and they're going to be introduced to a character Mickey. Their attention is going to be directed away from those characters and then they're going to get a pronoun. And then they're going to hear a little bit more discourse that's going to resolve that pronoun. Um, in a condition like this, participants just have to um, just, they have to um, map that gender reference to the discourse history and to select a referent. Um, a more challenging condition is when you introduce ambiguity. So here we have two female characters and they're going to get the pronoun she. We know that English healthy, under, English speaking healthy undergrads um, in contexts like this where there's ambiguity, um, they have a bias towards selecting the first mentioned character. So um, even though temporal order can be encoded, there's still this bias to, as an initial interpretation, go with that first mentioned character. So um, before I show you the results, let me just orient you to the type of data that you're going to see. So on the x-axis, we have time in milliseconds. On the y-axis, we have the proportion of um, fixations to the target. 
um, you can see here those uh, two conditions. So D1 and D2, those are the conditions where the genders were different. And D1 is when the target was the first mentioned character, D2 the second. And here we have the second um, or the same gender condition where um, S1 is when the target is the first mentioned, S2 is the second mention. And you can see that in healthy undergrads, when the um, reference have different sex, there's a very rapid, quick um, selection of the accurate um, target in that when the target is actually the first mentioned character, participants find that character quickly, but you see a delay in finding the target reference when it's the second mentioned character, because again, there's this bias towards the first mentioned. So um, here's how healthy undergrads perform in this pronoun resolution task. These are healthy comparison participants that are demographically matched to our brain damage participants, so they are significantly older than the healthy undergrads, so we do not have an effect of age um, in this task. These are our brain damage comparison participants. These are the individuals with large bilateral VMPFC lesions, and these are the amnesics. So even in listening to a very short discourse history, um, they are impaired at using information about the relative salience of the reference to disambiguate um, the pronoun. And this is even true when the genders were different. So um, this suggests that hippocampal damage is contributing to online language processing. Um, and the, the new finding here um, was the time course. So um, it was previously thought that if an individual with amnesia had a conversation, there would be no deficit in processing and following what the speaker was saying in the moment, but the deficit would be in remembering the content. Here we're showing that as language unfolds in real time, the hippocampus is playing a critical role in maintaining those representations and probably also in the encoding of the temporal order. So the participants either had to maintain the representation of what was said or they had to reinstantiate the temporal order to be successful in this task. And we've been, um, there's plenty of literature showing that those abilities are impaired in memory tasks. And here we're showing those deficits extend to language processing. We switch gears a little bit and tell you about some work we've done on multimodal language processing. And this is work done by Katie Hilverman, um, who's a postdoc in my lab. So when we talk, we move our hands. Um, our co-speech gestures that co-occur with our spoken language are tempor temporally linked to our speech and semantically related to the content of our speech. Um, a unique feature of gesture is that um, the information that we put on our hands is iconically related to our thoughts. So just in the way that we encode the contents of our thoughts in our speech, um, there's also elements of our thoughts on our hands. Um, and if we think about the types of information that can come out on our hands and information that would be stored in memory, this can be memory for imaginistic features. So you can talk about the, the size of something or its shape. Um, there can also be memory for action or motor responses. So if I want to think about how to make my favorite sandwich, I can give um, different um, motor acts to describe how to do that. So we've long known that the hippocampus plays a critical role in generating and reconstructing multifaceted representations that we have in our mind. We know that um, these representations support the speech that we produce and that the speech we produce is temporally and semantically linked with what comes out on our hands. So we were interested in what role hippocampal mediated representations might play in gesture production. So this was an existing data set um, that we had, but that we hadn't ever looked at gestures. And so these are discourse samples of um, our participants with amnesia um, talking about different autobiographical experiences and procedural discourse. Um, we looked at the amount of speech they produced and then we looked at gesture rate. And so we, co we coded all the gestures they produced and we categorized them as iconic, didactic, or beat. And there's no differences in the groups in the distribution or proportion of those. So I'm not gonna talk about those different subcategories of gesture. So um, one critical finding is that in these discourse samples, the patients with amnesia are talking the same amount as healthy people, but they're gesturing significantly less. 
There is nothing about these patients or their neurological profiles that affect their motoric abilities. They do not have paralysis or hemiparesis or spasticity. So there's no motor component that would explain why they're gesturing less. So we now know that they gesture less, even though they speak the same amount. What we're interested now in is tying that more directly to hippocampal mediated representations. So a um, very common way to code um, narratives or memory represent representations um, in the memory literature is to then code all of the speech for internal features and external features. And these internal features loosely map onto episodes or episodic memory. So they have the related richness, um, perceptual details, um, very specific pieces of information so that when you hear these details, you can bring to your own mind's eye um, the episode or the content. These external details are more semantic, and so they're more factual, um, and they're less autobiographical in nature. And so what we find is that in healthy participants, gesture rate goes up as the number of episodic features that are contained in their speech samples. So as they're talking more about things that are episodic, that have long been tied to the integrity and health of the hippocampal system, their gesture rate goes up. That is not true for the participants with amnesia. So what we're um, starting to think more and more about is this relationship between um, hippocampal mediated representations and how they support gesture and in different contexts. Um, and so we're also looking more at these discourse production phenomenon, but we're also looking at what happens when you have to learn a skill or task with your hands. Um, and uh, we're seeing the reverse pattern there. So there are instances where their speech is impaired, so they don't have the episodic details in their speech because they don't remember having done it, but the experience of having done the task is revealed on their hands. So in terms of these conscious, explicit mental representations, we're seeing that um, there's a relationship between the episodic detail that's in the mental representation and the amount of gesturing when you talk about those mental representations. And if you have impoverished hippocampal representation, that impoverishment extends to the information that's conveyed in your hands. And I will, um, the last thing I want to tell you about um, is how hippocampus contributes to arbitrary relations for language learning and the maintenance um, of language. So, Almost all theories of hippocampal functioning um, subscribe to this idea that the hippocampus plays a critical role in the binding of arbitrary relations. And this arbitrary binding permits um, the binding of co-occurrences of people, places, and things. And it's this binding that gives rise to our episodic memory. So you can think later today or tomorrow about being in this room at this time and that I was speaking, and you can reconstruct those co-occurrences to have a mental representation of this moment. Um, the hippocampus is also critical in binding together the phonological, conceptual, and orthographic relations that make up the lexicon or our semantic system. Um, so you can acquire a word and its meaning and later recover the phonological form, the orthographic form, and its conceptual meaning. So at the heart of amnesia, at the heart of having damage to the hippocampus is this impairment in the acquisition of new arbitrary relations. Um, the field, the, the memory field, has long thought um, and demonstrated this critical role for the hippocampus in the acquisition of um, arbitrary relations and as it pertained to language in our ability to acquire new vocabulary words. So, um, patients who have the pathology that I've talked about um, struggle tremendously to learn new semantic information. So um, studies that try to teach them new vocabulary words, if they're successful at all, it may take hundreds of trials to learn a new word and its meaning. But the memory literature has thought that the contribution of the hippocampus to semantic memory was time limited and that via neocortical consolidation, 
Um, so the hippocampus is playing a critical role in bringing that information in, but that over time, the hippocampus becomes independent and that knowledge can live in cortical structures independent of the hippocampus. And the evidence for that thinking came from um, testing the naming ability or the semantic memory abilities of patients who had hippocampal amnesia. And what they find is that um, the, pa the patients are um, profoundly impaired at acquiring new information, but if you ask them to label or provide definitions or do matching tasks for semantic tasks for information they learned long before the onset of their amnesia, they look like normals. But everyone in this room is well aware that um, semantic representations are a little bit more complicated than that. There's a difference between the superficial pairings between um, the, the breadth of your semantic system and the depth of your semantic system. Um, we also know that word learning is a protracted experience. So our ability to add information to the semantic concepts we have is something that continues across the lifespan. So with those um, criticisms or critiques of the previous memory literature, um, we wanted to go back and really address this question in more detail, and that is, is it actually the case that remote semantic memory is intact in patients who have amnesia, and is it really true that the hippocampus plays a time-sensitive or time-limited role in the acquisition of semantic information? So the first um, task we asked our patients to do was a features generation task. So they know what a lemon is, and if you show them a picture, they could name lemon. But that's different than being able to list a bunch of features about a lemon. So a lemon can taste sour, you can say it's native to Asia, grows on small evergreen trees, it's eaten in pies, it's used in tea. That's all this rich semantic information you have that's associated with a lemon. And we find that um, the patients with hippocampal amnesia can produce significantly fewer features of highly common highly familiar words, and there's no difference in familiarity ratings in these words between these groups, um, but they produce significantly fewer features than do the BDC group or healthy comparisons. We next ask them to perform a senses task. So um, lexical items can have multiple senses. So if we stick with lemon, um, a lemon can be the fruit, the tree, the color, the scent, or defective automobile. So we provide a word and we say, tell us as many senses of this word as you can. Again, highly common, uh, high frequency, high familiarity. These patients with amnesia, native English speakers, college educated, acquired their amnesia long, you know, in their mid-20s all the way to their mid-40s. This is not a developmental um, condition. And yet they can produce significantly fewer senses of words than um, the comparison groups. We next gave them a word association test, and there's two components to this. So we ask them about synonyms, and so they're given a target word like sudden, and we say of these four words, pick two that could be a synonym. So here for sudden, you would pick quick or surprising, and surprising, and then we look at collocates, so words that frequently co-occur, and uh, here, um, it is permissible to say in English, a sudden change or a sudden noise, but you don't hear the co-occurrence of sudden doctor, sudden school. So what's interesting about this task is it's really like a grammaticality check, right? Is this permissible in your language? And yet, the patients with hippocampal damage are less successful at making these grammaticality judgments about their language than healthy comparison participants and brain damage participants. So here, I would argue strongly that the remote semantic memory system is not intact in patients with amnesia, and this would go in contrast to the traditional consolidation view um, where the idea was that hippocampus was playing a time-sensitive role, and I would argue that the hippocampus seems to be playing a far more extended role in the life of our semantic representations. So um, what we're spending a lot of time trying to think about now is why. Um, is this a failure to update? So our semantic system is enhanced by 
are moving through the world, um, experiencing semantic representations, hearing language, reading language, using language, that strengthens um, our underlying representations and the relationships between um, words or items? Or is it a case of language attrition? So are we observing um, a failure to maintain or a loss of previously acquired information? I'm going to tell you about how we're thinking about it, and I suspect that at the end of the day, these are two sides of the same coin. So this is work that's being done by Natalie Covington in my lab. Um, and so when we started thinking about what would a failure to update um, new learning of arbitrary relations, um, we know that hippocampal produces a profound impairment in new word learning, but there's also new evidence that hippocampal damage disrupts statistical learning. And so there's been a couple of studies. This is ours. Um, these are patients, again, who have hippocampal damage and profound declarative memory impairment. Um, and they have disruptions in acquiring statistical regularities, um, shapes, symbols, scenes. They seem to do a little bit better on tones, but they're not tracking and encoding and maintaining the regularities um, of their environment. Um, when we think about language loss, um, we started asking, well, how can we get information about things they should know or should have um, that they may or may not? And so we found these uh, tasks that were developed to study um, grammaticality judgments of college undergrads who were second language learners. And so these are just grammaticality permissibility tests. So in this one, um, participants are given, um, this is one item, they're given three phrases, and they're told that one of the three is a natural frequent word combination and to select it. And um, while we don't reach um, statistical threshold, you can see that these college-educated native English speakers are performing numerically worse than the demographically matched healthy participants. And this is two standard deviations below the 18-year-old um, second language learners. And these are just some examples of things they endorsed that they shouldn't have or did endorse um, incorrectly or failed to endorse, rather. So on this task, um, each item is a phrase, and they're just asked to say yes or no. Is this permissible in the language? Um, and again, these college-educated native speakers um, seem to have lost the strength or the ability to recognize um, high-frequency phrases in their language. And these are just some examples of um, errors, either endorsing when they should not have or failing to when they should have. So here we're seeing that um, the hippocampus does play a role in the acquisition of new arbitrary relations, um, even when it's slow and incremental and there are statistical regularities in them. But it also seems that the hippocampus is playing a role in the maintenance of um, previously acquired uh, representations. And we're also quite interesting to think about what um, cascading or downstream deficits there may be. So if you're having difficulty um, knowing which words go together, um, we know that ability um, facilitates language processing in terms of predictive processing. So would these patients also have difficulty with predictive um, language processing? So I told you a lot of things that we've been doing. I've given you a lot of evidence, um, hopefully compelling, um, for the role that the hippocampus plays in language use and processing. Um, but how do we make sense of this? So you've all been taught um, somewhere along the way um, that the hippocampus is a critical structure for memory. How do we make sense of the fact that the hippocampus is making critical contributions to language, as I've shown you here? Um, but I could have given you another talk on the role of hippocampus in social cognition or empathy um, or decision making. And so the way I think about it is if we move away from these really strict brain behavior relationships, this idea that hippocampus does memory, and instead think more critically about the core processing features provided by the hippocampus, representational flexibility, arbitrary binding, online maintenance, then it makes perfect sense why the hippocampus has been such a critical neural structure in support of episodic memory. But it also then begins to make great sense why the hippocampus would be recruited in the service of language processing that also requires many of those same 
key processing features. Um, so this is what we've been doing for almost 15 years, is trying to catalog the occasions and the domains of language use and processing where the hippocampus makes a critical contribution. Um, and in doing so, I would also argue that we are making the case that the hippocampal declarative memory system um, is making a critical contribution to the language network. And data like these expand that cognitive and dynamic network of structures that are critical for language use and processing. Moving forward, it's going to be really important for us to characterize the nature and time course of hippocampal declarative memory interactions with the more canonical um, cognitive and language processing uh, network. Um, but this work has uh, tremendous implications for understanding um, the underlying mechanisms of communicative disruption in conditions like Alzheimer's disease or traumatic brain injury, um, where declarative memory and hippocampal impairments are hallmark, but for which the long list of um, communicative deficits they have are seldom attributed to that neural system, but rather assumed to be um, caused by disruptions in the frontal lobes. So thank you so much for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. We take questions from the room, and then um, online people can ask questions in the chat box. Yeah. So you mentioned that, for example, uh, uh, the participants with amnesia, right, they uh, are, like, you know, like less accurate in, the, in, in, in those word associations, right? Mm -hmm. Is it that they make more mistakes or they make um, less attempts? Ah, more mistakes. And There's no it, difference in attempts. Oh, and did you also mention that, that they actually make more attempts? Well, on the, the co-location uh -huh. ones, those are fixed. Okay. So it's oh. a number of items and then you endorse. Okay. Um, they, they answer all the questions. Mm -hmm. very compliant. Um, so it's a, it's a problem with errors, not uh, attempts. This may be a rather silly question, but when you're testing these patients with amnesia, do you often have one item of the task of what you're supposed to do? Or? Um, so there are multiple memory systems in the brain that are dedicated to different types of learning. Um, in the um, collaborative referencing test that you saw, um, what was typically common is the first couple of trials, I would come back in, I'd give them feedback, I'd set the cards back up, and then the participant with amnesia would say, what are you doing, where are you going, what are we doing? And I would leave the room and then their familiar partner would describe all the instructions again. They had no idea that they had just done this, what they were doing. But trial after trial, this other memory system, the slow, incremental, non-declarative memory system, they get into a group. And so there was even, um, one of my favorite examples of this, the familiar partner gives the instructions again. And he's like, okay, then let's start with, and they went right into to naming them. So that's a great example of um, the different types of information that get encoded. And it's also a great question because the, the memory literature, in their attempt to define and characterize these memory systems, I really look for tasks that disproportionately load on to those two memory systems. But in reality, they're, we draw on them for all behaviors and they're in constant interaction. And so I think you know, moving forward, we have to sort of piece them back together and try to figure out how they contribute in service of what healthy people do every day in terms of complex behavior. Right. So I guess I'm thinking about the word association test mm -hmm. and the way you were describing it as yes. a roughly a grammaticality test and your earlier discussion about creativity and language. Mm -hmm. So some of the recent, like or the original arguments for creativity and language were things like color the screen ideas, sleep furiously. Mm -hmm. right? So those are the classic kinds of cases. Mm -hmm. And so in one characterization, you might say that they're not as lexically creative, but they're being quite creative in terms of their combinatoric system. Can you offer a reason to think that's not the right way to think about that data? Well, what would the evidence be for th th there's good evidence of their combinatorial system? Well, so like run a bath, for instance, mm -hmm. is a perfectly acceptable phrase to me, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so many of these kind of phrases that might be sort of um, low frequency or mm -hmm. up to zero frequency might have potential interpretations or idiomatic interpretations. And so the, there might be creativity there. And so right. it's not clear to me what kinds of mistakes they're making. So 
I'm just wondering, like, it seems like the whole story is that their creativity might be less, but mm -hmm. maybe there's this element in the combinatorical system that's, you know, because of the less, you know, their, their conceptual or lexical systems are less robust, they're using more of it. I just wondered if you had thought see. about that. Um, not in that sense, but we, two things. In the memory literature, we have some data on this, but it's been done far more by other labs, have really looked at that combinatorial piece in terms of combining and recombining things in terms of what makes an episode. So um, I gave an example earlier that you can have a memory of all these pieces, but what's really robust about the hippocampal system is that you don't have to bring up the entire piece of, the entire representation to get at it. Rather, you can pick and you can tell a story about this and you can say, oh, I saw Melissa at this conference and then I met her two weeks later and now you're bringing those things together and you're leaving it in, I think, that generative combinatorial way, and these patients do very, very little of that. And in fact, that kind of generative deficit or combinatorial deficit is um, also considered a hallmark of the deficit itself. Um, we have another data set where we ask um, the participants to judge and give us interpretations for idioms and metaphors, um, and they're impaired at those things. So these and many, I mean, some are tough, right? Uh, they're, they're, they're zero frequency. Um, no one has said this before, but can you come up with an interpretation for it? And they can't. But they also fail to produce um, accurate, plausible interpretations for things that should have been highly overlearned um, in, in adolescence. Um, I want to go back to the barrier test. I was trying mm -hmm. to picture my husband and me trying to do that together. <laughs> but I'm thinking, boy, those people will really come. Um, did you control for, were they all spouses? How long did they know each other? Did you control for those kind of things? Um, a little. So we controlled for, they had to be um, highly familiar and routine communication partners. Um, so I think we defined that by having um, five or more years of frequent, defined by weekly, communication and contact. Um, there was um, no controlling for spouses, siblings, or friends. Um, a long, that was a long dissertation period to collect all these data. There were multiple versions of the task, and I, I thought it would have been helpful to have some kind of counseling uh, training along <laughs> the way for exactly um, Exactly. Exactly. I guess one thing I'm thinking about, did they know them before the damage, before they did the Campbell damage? 90% um, knew them before. Okay. So they had that joint reference from... They had that joint reference, but again, part of the nature of the deficit is that these patients don't take full advantage of that. Mm -hmm. And so um, in the verbal uh, creativity, verbal play, um, so notice that when I reported that they have this disruption or impairment, it's not zero. So they're doing some of these things. And so what would happen is um, a participant with amnesia would make the joke, and then the familiar partner wanted to play with that. And so in a subsequent trial, trial would bring that joke back up, but the history was gone. So they have this shared history, but they don't, they don't access it. They don't take advantage of it. And then in their language, you know, they're even using linguistic forms that um, are devoid of that shared history. Do you have a question? Yeah, it was just about like, uh, you mentioned how you tested idioms and metaphors. I was mm -hmm. wondering if there were any differences in how they did idioms and metaphors, since idiom usually has like one meaning that you have to remember, whereas metaphors are more creative. Um, so did they have different deficits between those two categories? The blunt measures, you know, just accuracy. Mm -hmm. um, but no, nothing stands out, um, but we're getting ready to start writing that up and and maybe we'll find some of those. How about deficits, uh, if you don't, I mean, literature on just the creativity that's not created in, creative in one sense, but not sort of non-literal, like, uh, you know, just, you know, novel uh, phrases, something like the blue tortoise, you know, chase the horse or something like that, right? Something that they haven't encountered, but yes. it's, like, you know, if you do the combinatorial syntax and you do your semantics, it just yep. kind of puts a sort of, sort of more linear, but still combinatorial. Yes. Sorry. So we have a study um, where we give them, they're given two words, and they're asked to make a compound of them. 
um, right. yeah. I'm drawing a blank on those now. Um, things that have never gone together, and then you come up with, um, and they're told to make this as novel and creative and plausible, you know, as, as you can, and they just, they're, they're very literal, you know. So, but they are still commentarial in that sense. Right? Yeah, so they come up with something that uh, incorporates Both the two elements. components, um, but it's typically giving that object that function. So it's a cow that can also be a bucket. Um, you know, so it's, um, they're combining uh -huh. them, but... <laughs> so, so yeah, that's the question I'm getting at, right? Yeah. So a lot of what people are talking about in syntax and semantics mm -hmm. is this combinatorial capacity of just, right. you have some dominant interpretation of a lexical item, it's mm -hmm. arranged into a structure, which just right. tells you the relations, right. and then on top of that, there's this flexible creative thing. Right. So is it fair to say that there's a dissociation in those capacities? That there's some combinatorial ability that's quote intact versus a more flexible creative thing. Yes, I will tentatively say that I think our data suggests that. Okay. So they can bring the things together, but they lack right. that creative addition to it. Going beyond in some sense. Going beyond, the, the yes, yes, exactly. Okay. They, they lack that ability. Thank you. That ability is disruptive. Is that what you I wonder if you now think, or if, if you think that um, acquisition and maintenance are inherently inextricable, right? So are they, uh, are they never separated, or do we know of other deficits that are specific to either the, just the maintenance or the acquisition of uh, items in that? I can, we do not have any data that speak strongly to a strong dissociation. So I think that they are in, intimately intertwined. Um, that said, I think that different neural systems may be weighted differently in terms of the role they play in those two highly intertwined, inextricably linked processes. So the deficit in the patients in not a new acquisition of information is profound. I mean, a mere inability to acquire new information. Um, it's very surprising that they appear to be unable to maintain previously acquired information, but I don't think the magnitude of that deficit is the same. So that makes me think that the campus is playing a fundamental role in certain, in the acquisition of certain types of information, and that it's playing a important role in the maintenance yeah. of that information. So, question online from Bree Stark, who uh, used to be a postdoc here. I know Bree. Now flown out. These are great examples of differences in language abilities with hippocampal damage. Do you know of any additional macro linguistic issues, high level language problems in this population? I'm thinking of examples from the MTL epilepsy literature, like global, local, cohesion, coherence, understanding garden path sentences, story grammar, etc. So they have impairments in cohesion um, and coherence in their productive discourse. Um, we've never done garden path sentences with them, but are happy to. Um, and we've um, not done the story grammar, but I can say that they have the, having not done the formal analysis, when they tell narratives, they have a, a decent structure to them. When we do procedural discourse um, samples with them, um, they produce the same number of steps as healthy participants. Um, they're just less rich and detailed and contain language that um, is less um, imageable and detailed and things like that. And we have a question from Matt Siegelman online. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Given that uh, patients with hippocampal amnesia exhibit deficits in word co-occurrence judgments, for example, seize an opportunity versus do an opportunity in a laboratory setting, a judgment which seems very fundamental to the processes of language comprehension and production. Why have language deficits in amnesia been unrecognized and unstudied for so long? 
HM was thought for a long time to have intact language capabilities. Is it possible that HC damage does not cause deficits in such semantic composition, but simply manifests as an inability to explicitly, declaratively make judgments about disconnected examples of language in a lab setting? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the working Do capacity for this. <laughs> yeah. Um, fantastic question. Um, I think the reason that um, people early classified or described HM as having normal language was because he didn't have aphasia. Right? So this was. He was one of 13 people who had this experimental surgery. He was the only clean one to study. who didn't have you know, extensive cognitive disruption, um, who didn't have a continuous or subsequent psychiatric condition. So when people were trying to understand the nature of the consequence of the surgery, um, he could have conversations. He was fluent. Um, there was nothing that approached aphasia or semantic dementia. So check, check, check. And again, all the, the measures that would be used to assess that came from the aphasia literature, right? So didn't have aphasia. So what do, you, what do you want to spend your time working on? What about this memory impairment that we have never observed before? We've never been able to link um, with neurobiology. So that's why people spent all of that attention. But there's a paper as early as 1974 questioning the intact language um, descriptions of um, HM. Um, Don Mackay has accessed um, many, many archival um, recordings and um, transcripts of HM's data and reports almost all the same deficits that we're finding in this group. That said, I don't believe that uh, while the deficit we are observing is clinically meaningful and in some cases um, highly disruptive and uh, severe, um, it pales in comparison to the language deficits observed in aphasia. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can only capture them under these highly contrived laboratory grammaticality um, decisions. Once you're keyed in to these sorts of disruptions and then you have a conversation with them, you are struck by some of these um, disruptions. But again, when you meet someone like this and you're told they have amnesia, um, you're very, uh, caught off guard by how quickly they ask for repetition um, or have forgotten where they are. Um, but they're still speaking fluently and, and responding appropriately in terms of taking their turn. So the, the magnitude of those deficits within an individual are quite striking. And so I think that's why. It reminds me just a little bit of so something we have with uh, speakers with aphasia. Mm -hmm. If they're really on the high end, they may sometimes test as non-phasic on our batteries. Absolutely. And even, even though if you speak to them, or they will self-report that yes. you're, it's really not completely unimpaired, there's right. something going on. That's right. really, at that high end, it's very hard to capture. Absolutely. In, in that and we were having this conversation earlier today. Um, you know, when we make decisions about um, language, we are at these two extremes. There's whatever we call healthy, and maybe that's just non-aphasia, and then we have these profound disruptions. Um, we know almost nothing about the, the tail end of the normal distribution of healthy, normal language. What does that look like? Um, and we also know significantly less about these very high um, performing individuals who have aphasia, who aren't captured by um, a, a large set of materials that often lack the sensitivity and specificity um, to measure all kinds of things, um, but that were designed to capture these very frank disruptions in language. No other questions online? So, no other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.